Economic Alliance presents the Gulf Coast Growth Show, your show for the coast with the most growth, with your host, Jason Lee and Clint Aiken. All right, and welcome to the Gulf Coast Growth Show, your show for the coast with the most growth. And I'm Jason Lee and I'm Clint Aiken. And we are he- yeah, we are here with Heather Betancourt. Is that correct? Correct. Awesome. Fantastic. And we're going to dive into uh, uh, Heather's background and, and really what qualifies her to be here today and, and educate us and spend some time with us. But I want to make sure our audience understands what our topic is today. And really, we're, 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 spe- we're speaking specifically to economic development, some of the dynamic things that are happening in our region, uh, the growth, and, and but specifically a little niche of the, the woods that we call Baytown. So we're excited to, to really dive into that and uh, learn some more about it. So every, every little city that's anchored into the Economic Alliance, I think we support 12 cities, four counties, uh, all have a certain amount of pride in their own little uh, piece that, uh, that they speak to. So she's a city council woman, and we're excited to hear uh, what she has to say. So with that being said, why don't you give us a little bit of background? I mean, uh, not only your role, but what got you into the role. I think you, you shared a really neat story earlier. And both just, roles. Too. We want both yeah, roles. Right. Who are you? You got, you got yeah. two hats. I do. Right. I, I do have two hats. <laughs> so um, I am on city council for the city of Baytown, representing District 4. I was elected in November 2017, so I haven't even finished my first term yet. Um, I also work for Chevron Phillips Chemical in a very community-facing role. Um, public affairs, managing um, the company's image and reputation in the East Harris County area. So um, I do try to separate the two as much as I can, but I mean, let's be honest, it's industry, it's Baytown. I mean, they they constantly merge and there's constant partnerships. So I actually find that my dual role serves um, both purposes equally well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you shared a really interesting story uh, prior to turning the camera on about kind of your your passion and what led you and, and now into it. I just I, I'll let you tell it because you told it way better but why don't you tell us kind of what got you into this chair and where your heart's at sure I think this is um, one of your uh, life doesn't really take the path that you always plan stories so um, my dream was to be a journalist okay. and uh, I was going to be like Woodward and Bernstein and I was going to uncover like the great you know, government scandal and be the community watchdog. And um, and I remember actually one of my college professors telling me, um, you weren't going to make a lot of money doing this, but you were going to change the world. And I thought that was so amazing. And that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be the person that changed the world. And I, I don't care how much, you know, I got paid. And then reality, of course, is much different because you're living on your own and your parents aren't paying your bills anymore. And suddenly <laughs> money actually matters. And so I had to switch gears and uh, transitioning to public relations is a, is a pretty easy um, turn to make for a journalist. So I went to public relations. It still gave me the capacity to do communication storytelling, but paid a lot better. And then I find myself uh, in a community public relations role, and a lot of the members in the community that I interface with thought I would be a good candidate for city council. And so it turns out that I'm now able to actually help people and make changes not necessarily in journalism but in government so it's a it's a funny twist how life takes you sometimes and but you're still able to live out your passion and that's what's awesome right yeah. a- absolutely and your passions change I think as you grow older and mature so I mean I wanted to make a difference um, and I am it's just not in the way that I originally thought it was going to be that's uh, that's I, I just love the story and uh, and I think it's interesting getting to hear all of our guests and when they share you know really where, where they're rooted in and where their passion lies and how it translates into their impact into our community I think it's awesome so and speaking of communities I think it's a great way to parlay into a conversation about uh, Baytown and some of the, and so this is your chance to take to share all things Baytown and because I know growing up in the area uh, you know what 20 years ago when I you know when I left Deer Park, uh, I knew of Baytown. Uh, we played Baytown every once in a while, but <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot of stuff in Baytown. You know, you could go to Baytown and then you could slide right down and get on the water pretty easily, but that was about it. And now it's, uh, I mean, uh, I know everybody's trying to get there. So tell us a little bit about what's going on in Baytown. So I would say that your perception of Baytown is spot on. Okay. Um, I grew up in the spring in Woodlands area, and I remember when I first told my family 
I was gonna move to Baytown, they all had this look on their face like they had just like sucked a sour lemon. <laughs> and I thought, golly, like, I mean, is it gonna be like that bad? And, and apparently Baytown's claim to fame to the outside world is industry. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, it's a very dirty, blue collar uh, industry town. And of course the 1980s San Jacinto Mall, which in its heyday is long gone now. Right. And so, um, Baytown is is nothing like that perception and actually one of the platforms that I ran on for City Council and is probably due to my public relations background was I wanted to help change that and um, I started off by being on the Imagine Baytown committee which was a committee that the City Council at the time uh, had formed of community members to assess what the community wanted Baytown to be in the next five years and then they would use that to create a five-year strategic plan. Right. And the number one top initiative that our community wanted, and we did surveys and round tables, and we met with different groups and HOAs and neighborhoods. I mean, we, we talked to as many people as we could. And the number one initiative that came out was change Baytown's image and reputation. Oh, wow. And I thought, well, I am the girl <laughs> for that job. <laughs> and so um, it's been my uh, mission and passion ever since then to help change Baytown's image and reputation. So the first thing I want to talk about is um, all that we're doing to bring Baytown into uh, modern life, I guess you would say. So we have a lot of new developments. You know, you you go to the Woodlands, you go to Houston, and you have like the favorite places you like to eat. Um, right. You know, Salada or Mod Pizza, um, and a lot of people don't know like those those same things are coming to Baytown now. Right. So it's not like you're lacking and you're only going to have you know Luby's or Dairy Queen. We're not really in the sticks anymore. We are a major hub just on the east side of Harris County. Um, I would say the biggest one that we're doing right now is bringing back the mall. So there's a there's a mall crisis across the country if you if you've ever read about it where they're just dying and they just stay there and they almost look like malls from the zombie apocalypse. They're boarded up, no one visits <laughs> them. There there's nothing being done to change them and our mall was like that. And um, the citizens really wanted the city to do something about the mall. And for those that know, um, the city can't really force a private property owner to do much, especially if they're not violating the law. And so as much as our citizens wanted us to do something with the mall, we're really limited. I mean, Texas has strong property rights, just just like they should. And so we can't really force the mall owner to make a better mall. So um, the city had to work for a very long time and be very, very creative in getting the mall owner to not only sell to a developer who was interested, but also we had to make it worthwhile to that new developer to invest millions upon millions in revitalizing the mall. So um, that's where um, an economic development agreement that cities use a lot called 380 comes into play and these um, economic development agreements can be as unique and varied as the city itself. Um, I think they get a bad rap a lot. Um, Some people call it corporate welfare and um, it's really not. There are um, times where tax abatements are put into play so they may not have to pay their property taxes for five to seven years or they may not pay a sales tax revenue to the city for a certain amount of time. But the way I look at it is uh, we own a home. Well, let's say we own a we own a vacant piece of land and we're paying HCAD based on the value that HCAD values our vacant land and we're paying right. property taxes based on that value. Well, you wouldn't want to pay the full value of the house you haven't built yet right. on that vacant land. Yeah, and so it, that's, that's the, the corporate welfare uh, argument. And I think it's a false narrative because we're not going to tax them on future development. We're going to give them that incentive so that they can go ahead and invest their money. And then once it's fully developed... Uh, then they would pay the full amount of taxes on that new development. There's a lot of people out there who don't understand economics and, and what it is, period. <laughs> so getting them to understand that, you know, taking, giving them a little bit now, frees them with, gives them the cash flow so they can really pour into it, which then would generate larger tax revenues, right? That's right. So a lot of people just, they don't understand that basic economic principle. So, That's right. And it's, it's a, 
it's a fun and challenging thing that you get to do to educate them about that. <laughs> well, this goes a lot with industry too. So industries are under IDAs or industrial district agreements with a lot of the cities around here. And these are very, very important agreements to attract industry expansion. Um, why would we want industry expansion? It creates jobs and the economic trickle effect to, towards our communities is just um, immeasurable in some cases. Um, so my company, Chevron Phillips Chemical, they went through a $6 billion expansion project over the last seven years, and Baytown was at the heart of that project. Since that project, in conjunction with ExxonMobil's expansion project, we have seen five new housing developments, wow. the redevelopment of this wow. mall, all these new eateries, retail, shopping center. At the city council meeting uh, last night, our planning department was telling us about all the new housing developments that are planned, under construction, or already completed just because of these expansion projects. And I mean, this is not only new property tax revenue for a city, but these are people who shop mm -hmm. and eat and are going to live and, and utilize the services in our city. So these expansion projects are really, really important to our communities. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. It's kind of so growing up in this in, or being around this industry as long as I have. It's, it, whenever people are driving into Houston who aren't from this area and they drive down I-10, they're like, "Hey, what's that place with all the cranes?" <laughs> and I'm like, "Cedar Bayou, the, the CP Kim plant." And they're like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the name of it. It's the place with all the cranes." I'm like, "It's not a place for cranes." It's... Yeah, for a while people thought we were manufacturing cranes. There were that many there. But... Yeah, oh, wow. Yeah. It, was, it was just great to see it growing though, because you know, for those of us that do understand the industry a little bit better. Um, seeing all that development going on, it's, it's just, I understand how it affects the local level as well, right? I mean, y'all hired, it allows you to hire hundreds of people, right? So and the, now those hundreds of people still have jobs at that facility. That's right. And so now they're back in the community, and so you're continuing to help support them there, and that, that's very commendable. And so in addition to those hundreds of jobs, um, our, ours particularly was 300 new permanent positions. ExxonMobil was uh, pretty similar, a little more. But during that five to seven year period, we had 10,000 uh, temporary construction workers in the area. Mm -hmm. So wow. did ExxonMobil. The city estimates they were able to retain 20% of that temporary workforce. Wow. That's awesome. Which is what's also driving the housing community. Wow. Um, we also do something for small businesses. So it's not just if you're the billion dollar Chevron and Exxon. <laughs> so we have something called a, a revitalization incentive zone. And I think this is really important because a lot of cities struggle with the new part of town versus the old part of town. Mm -hmm. And um, for Baytown, uh, it's called the north side. And it's where um, our facility sits by I-10 in the mall. And that's the new area. That's where all the new houses are going. And that's where the new price point is heading. And so the, the old or the south part of town, it's really um, easy to forget and stop developing in there because they're usually landlocked. Mm -hmm. um, all the buildings are older and aging. And I mean, how does a city make a private? property owner you know right. modernize their facility especially if they're not doing anything wrong so we had to be really creative and so we created this revitalization incentive zone and basically allows any uh, redevelopment and modernization of commercial and residential properties within this zone and it's a map and it's in the older part of town and they get um, they get um, Tax, tax abatements, they get their permit fees waived. Oh, wow. If they're able to um, increase the value of the property by 20%, um, you know, the incentives get even greater. Awesome. And so this is for even if you're revitalizing your, your own house and you live over there. Um, Texas Avenue, that's our, I guess, our our main drag, like our, our heyday, you know, right, where, right. where everyone used to hang out. And so it's been really important to the community that... see that on Days and Confused? Probably. It's probably <laughs> just, just like that. <laughs> but it's been important to people that we don't just let it continue to crumble and we actually do something. The cities had to actually go in and buy some of the landmark buildings. So use tax money to buy some of these landmark buildings, redevelop them, and then open them back up to the public. And so tonight, we're actually opening the old Brunson Theater. And this is an, an old theater from the 60s that people are going to go and be able to go back and enjoy and remember that their childhood is there. That's e so cool. Except That's awesome. right. instead of making it a movie theater, because what does the city know about opening a movie theater? We've made it a business incubator. 
So if cool. you're someone who has a business idea, but you don't quite have the capital to rent or lease uh, or buy a brick and mortar building and start your business, you can go to this business incubator at a very, very low rate for a limited amount of time, like eight to 12 months, for example. And you have an office, computer equipment, a meeting room. I mean, you are legitimately set up and you can start your business in this incubator. And then when your time's up, eight to 12 months, let's say, we then will help you move into brick and mortar, which isn't owned by the city, but uh, a landowner in Baytown. Very nice. That's so cool. It's like uh, the the Heights and Edo and all that cool yes. stuff. Y'all are just doing it on the old school. The only difference is everybody who's going to be hanging up the little trendy cafe tapas slash wine bars. We are, are okay be, with that. Be Bring roll- on the wine bars. Yeah, they're like, hey, um, I don't, you know, how, how many 250s can you fit, like F-250 jacked up trucks can you fit in a wine bar parking lot? Because I don't think they've ever had to experience that over in the Heights. Let's find so, out then. <laughs> like, is there a place for me to eat tapas in my fishing boat? Because I, I'm heading, heading down to... So uh, all of you Lyft drivers yeah, out there... Yeah, and I have a, I have a serious question about the mall. Will it have a Sparrow or whatever, that pizza place? Because if, if you put one of those there, people will come. Sabaro? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I think it already has one right now. I'll be honest. Is it the only thing that's left? <laughs> You're showing your age. Hey, that's what I said. I was like, if you put one of the Sabaro things, people will come. Because I that's the only reason I still go to the mall that and uh, buy pagers. Yeah. So. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> hey, uh, so I know. I, I know. Too. Yeah, well, you, you, at least you look old. Yeah, um, yeah so <laughs> let's dive into um, – well, you, you've got a little bit about it, yeah, so, right? Yeah, um, so – yeah, we're going to shift gears a little bit um, now that we've made all of our old people jokes. Um, we're talking about uh, working collaboratively, collaboratively in the industry. You know, I, we were talking before we started recording about the ITC fire and some of the lessons learned. You wanted to address the Exxon fire and the lessons learned and how much, um, how much better that was handled. I, I would say that um, industry and the community, it is so important that they're partners. Um, for, for this region especially, um, I don't think you can talk to many city officials in East Harris County that don't already know this um, because it starts way before there's an incident. I mean, an incident happens, and if that's the first time you're picking up the phone to call your mayor, it's, it's too late. So these partnerships are established long, long, long ahead of ever an incident happening. And most, most industries, especially the big names, they, they know that and they do that. And um, that's why you see them, you know, uh, funding United Way campaigns, building Habitat for Humanity homes, going into the classroom, uh, donating money, donating volunteers, uh, spending time with the elected officials, because it, it is a relationship. It is a partnership. Um, industry in Baytown accounts for more than half of our general fund. Mm. That is a big deal. Our general fund is how we pave roads and keep sewer and water lines running and have parks and hike and bike trails. So if industry just suddenly went away because, say, they were in an adverse political climate, um, that would be a major economic hit to our community that that none of us want to experience. Mm. So it's really important that we have a partnership. Now, in no way does you know industry run us, nor you know, nor is it the other way. It it is it, it is a partnership. So what I'm really proud of with the recent um, fire that happened at Exxon Mobil was how the city of Baytown and Exxon Mobil quickly came together. It was not this is Exxon's problem, or this is Baytown's problem. It was a public safety issue that we had to address together as a community. And I would say this started um, a year ago Mm. when we were uh, working on how do we improve the image and reputation of Baytown. And one of the first things we did was elevate the public relations program for the city of Baytown. We hired a director. We hired um, a media manager who had a Houston television uh, experience. She used to be on Channel 13. Nice. Um, we have um, a community engagement coordinator position we're looking to fill. Just a complete elevation of our PR efforts happened a year ago. And so then when this incident comes, they immediately know the first thing we need to do when Houston TV is descending on our town and, and showing that this you know flaming tower is burning into the sky, that we have to tell the story. Because if you're not telling the story for yourself, someone is telling it for you. Absolutely. So within three hours of that fire happening, 
ExxonMobil and the city of Baytown were having a joint press conference, and I thought it went off well. It was it was honest, it was factual, it was to the point, it, it told the public what they needed to do and not needed to do, what they should worry about and not worry about. I mean, and it was truly um, a public safety message. And, and, and I, think, I think it set a new standard for industry in this area on how they will cooperate in the future with local government agencies. We, awesome. we you know, the thing that's uh, beautiful about this region uh, specifically and, and what you just described uh, is the collaboration, but more importantly, the fact that um, the, the, the cities surrounding Baytown will learn from that experience. And so it's not just Baytown and Exxon, but it's going to go out and impact the communication, the awareness, and how probably each city approaches public relations and, and really the awareness to the person who's out there on the other side of the fence that doesn't understand all the great things that are taking place behind the fence to support and protect everybody inside of our communities. I think it's there's so much work that goes into it, and we're getting so great at communicating it. So it's phenomenal to have advocates like yourself uh, there at the city of Baytown to really drive public relations because it's critical. You know, maybe it helps a little bit that they got a PR person on city <laughs> council. Probably a little, probably some life lessons they were able to learn, which is great. So, um, but let's do this. Uh, now it's probably a great time to take a, a quick commercial break. When we get back, we'll talk specifically about your your role uh, as a female in the position that you're in and also with your PR background and the impact that it's had. So we'll take a quick commercial break, come back and talk about that. McCarthy Building Companies. From the Museum of Fine Arts to terminals on the Ship Channel, we understand the challenges and complexities you face when building here in the Gulf Coast. As the oldest privately held national construction company in the country, we have a clear focus on clients, community, and collaboration. Welcome back. We truly appreciate our sponsors. We can't do this without them, so thank you for listening to that brief commercial. Uh, Jason, you wanted to, before we left, you talked about um, maybe her role as a female in government and all that kind of stuff. So let's, you want to lead into that? Absolutely. Uh, this is something, you know, that's, you know, near and dear to my heart. A, because I have a, a mother who's uh, serves in, in a role with the city of, of Pasadena as a female, and she's been there for a long time. Uh, I'm proud of that. But at the same time, I have a daughter who I'm trying, she's 10 years old, I'm trying to introduce her to the world and what she's capable of. Uh, and so it really enthuses me when I get to see uh, both women in business industry just doing great things. Uh, for them and so to see somebody serving in, in a city uh, government position in your space uh, I would I'm just really inspired to hear a little bit more about what that's like the dynamics of it and the opportunity that you get to serve so so um, politics is definitely a male dominated field I think um, you can see that just by looking at your local representatives there are, are hysteri historically historically more men than women mm -hmm. um, so I think it's important for more women to take that leap into politics. Um, I know it can seem scary. It's not something you go to college for and, and, and put yourself on a path. It's really something more that you just decide to do and um, more men decide to do it than women. Um, I think women bring a unique uh, perspective to the table that um, we don't have a lot of. I mean, we have um, a different life experience than a man, and it's important that our government um, not only reflects the population that it serves, but that we just have a diversity of thought. Um, one of my favorite quotes is, if everyone thinks the same way, then nobody's really thinking. Yeah. And Ooh, so that's a good one. you have to have people of different backgrounds um, with different life experiences in order to have a diversity of thought, and I think women add that to uh, city governments. So when I talk to women in industry, I always try and encourage people, women to get into industry because I have three daughters and I want them to be able, I want someone to grab their hand and kind of help them out as well. Uh, one of the things I've, I've always appreciated about women in industry is they always ask so many more questions and that's a good thing. We mm -hmm. need to be asking more questions because that drives the communication, right? And that's how we both learn. So. I. You know, it's one of the things that I've kind of picked up on, and whenever I see women trying to get in the industry, I'm like, don't stop asking questions. Keep asking questions. Absolutely. I think one of the challenges is um, it's just it's just kind of a social stereotype of how women should behave or act. And, and uh, it, it, you know, it goes back long before any of us. And it's kind of like, you know, if, if, if you're aggressive, you're seen as kind of a strong leader. If, if I'm aggressive, 
then I'm I'm seen as bossy or you know unlikable, and so it's just it's just a social stereotype that um, unfortunately just exists, and we have to actually make a conscious effort to try to not think like that. Um, so a lot of women they they don't maybe speak up or they don't take on these challenging roles because it does require confrontation. Um, you when you're in politics, people don't always agree with you, and you have to have disagreements, and you have to deal with people who don't like you and don't like the way you think, and you have to be able to defend yourself and articulate your thoughts. And having kind of that um, confrontational nature about yourself just isn't um, a natural occurrence for a lot of women, and so uh, overcoming that and um, maybe getting more experience and practice and and being okay with the fact that people may not like you that's a big thing Mm -hmm. right you have to be okay that you're not going to be liked and i think that would help a lot of women uh, make that leap into politics a little more do you feel like um, because of this role or um, you know your your ability to step in and and try to assume this responsibility do you feel like you you kind of hold yourself to a higher level of responsibility or standards because of the way that you have to, I guess, walk into a room and know that you have to command the attention the right way and swivel, pivot the right way and maybe even go into the community so other females who might aspire to be in that role look at you in that light. I do. Um, I, I do think um, I'm looked at uh, differently. It may be because I'm young. Mm-hmm. I'm inexperienced, right? I've only been in politics for a year and a half. Um, how much the fact that I'm a female plays into people's perceptions, I'm not really sure. No one's ever outwardly said she doesn't know anything because she's a woman. But um, I do, you know, go into every situation uh, assuming I have to prove myself. And I have to know what I'm talking about. Um, I have to be able to deal with difficult people. And so every situation I go into, I'm probably harder on myself than people are actually hard on me. But um but I feel like I, I have to be that like that because there's not there's not enough of us out there. And so um, when you're putting yourself out there and you're one of the first ones, you really can't screw it up for everyone that comes behind you. So right, quite right. a responsibility. Yeah, no, it is right. You you you're if you're pioneering or, or stepping out in front, then that means you got to carve the right path, right, it's for people to follow you. So exactly. and I applaud you for your efforts. It's, it's amazing to see. Thank you. So Clint, so now we kind of change the tone of the show a little bit. We want to know a little bit more about you. So, um, you know, we know what you've done. We know who you work with. We know who you're working for, um, which is awesome. But um, what what motivates you? What does drive you? What gives you that that fire in the belly, which you clearly have, that says, hey, I'm going to get this done? I would say I'm naturally an overachiever. And that may or may not be a compliment, depending on who you ask. So I'm the kind of person where I'm given a task or a project, and I'm probably doing 10 times more than you actually needed me to do. Um, So I'd say I apply that to basically all aspects of my life. If you ask my husband and my kids how vacations are, they would tell you that I have it planned months in advance. <laughs> well, I know exactly what we're all gonna wear and where we're gonna go and what we're gonna do. And you know, sometimes they wish they could just chill, but uh, that you know, that's just not who I oh, am. Over, they had a great time. They, you right? know, they always do. Thank you very much. They have a great time. <laughs> They're like trucking behind the mountain, dragging bags, and you're like, you will thank me when you get older. And they're like, oh, God, Mom, I just want to. I'm always looking for, like, the things to do that no one else is doing, you know, like the the non-touristy places to go, and they're like, why are we on this weird hike? So, so, but. (laughs) Right? It's not a sunburn. It's burns of joy. They love it. They love (laughs) it. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, what else? So you talked. Uh, I know. I know you a little bit before the show. You talked a little bit about some of the things that Im- impacted you, that kind of led you to your success. I know you're an overachiever, but are there some experiences that you had that maybe are contributing factors that have also put you in the position that you're in? Absolutely. So um, I would say early on, some of the mistakes that I made um, was having such tunnel vision on the path that my life was supposed to go. And I think a lot of women make this mistake and they have it planned out by 25, I'm going to be doing this. And by 30, I'm going to be married. And by 33, I'm going to have two and a half, 2.5 kids and live in a house. And then I'm going to get my promotion by this age. And life just doesn't work that way. And when we have this kind of tunnel vision, uh, we really miss out on these opportunities 
um, that present themselves to us that really could take us where we want to go. It's just not on the path that we planned. Wow. So one of the things that I've learned recently is I, I say yes to almost every opportunity that comes my way, no matter how weird or like <laughs> not part of the plan it seems to be like getting invited to do this podcast. <laughs> so that was just a happenstance and I would never thought about doing a podcast or talking about myself, but it, it's a really enjoyable experience and who, awesome. who knows what will come of it. So, right. wow. so say, say yes to opportunities and get out of your tunnel vision. So is there any way after this, you, that whole, you don't have to plan everything, babies, everything has to happen at one time. So I've only been married for about a year now. So if I could just get you to record that on Facebook Live for my wife, that'd be fantastic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no it's true. A lot of women fall. And I'm going to sleep on the couch. Yeah, for that. yeah you so. will. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of women edit, fall into that. Yeah, right. Can we edit that out? Um, she, no, she gets me. Um, but yeah, I think that's uh, that's a great way to, to end the show, which is say yes, right? Don't be afraid. Uh, we, we had another guest earlier uh, today uh, that will come out uh, on, a, on a separate episode, but his key to success was very similar. And I think we'll hear the same underlying undertone. You can't be afraid to take on new things or box yourself into a certain place. And uh, it's easy that you – it's obvious based on how much you've done and what you've already accomplished and, you know, in your at your age, where you're at, what you're doing, that you're not – inside the box you're able to get outside the box yeah so you mentioned no fear that is a huge one uh don't be afraid so when i was approached to run for government i'd never ever thought about being in government running a campaign getting political and i had to say to myself don't be afraid uh just just do it and and so just because an opportunity comes that's strange or you think you can't do it or you're not qualified, uh, you're probably just talking yourself out of it. So uh, no fear and definitely say yes. Fantastic. That's awesome. Well, with that, let's uh, let's wrap up the show and, and really finish with the attitude of gratitude and what we're thankful for. Uh, first of all, Heather, we really appreciate you coming on the show today. Um, it's just been a pleasure and a delight to be around you. Um, I think what you what you're doing, I, and I know as we continue to get out to more events and do more things with the Economic Alliance, I'm probably going to get to see you more often and get connected. But it's exciting to have met you today and had you out on the show. Um, so Clint, why not why not fire away with your attitude of gratitude? What are you thankful for today? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, we were talking about kids, right? You were talking about taking your kids on vacation and stuff like that. Um, I'm really grateful that my your kids do force you out of your comfort zones. Right, uh, we we have these little set patterns and set ways we like doing things, and then kids just completely take that and throw it a different direction. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not a bad thing, right? Like you're talking about, the, there there doesn't have to be a plan every time, right? I mean, it's good to be able to adjust on the fly and live in the moment. So I'm just grateful because I had some opportunities to do that recently. Just kind of enjoy the moment, not have something that was, you know, planned and and let them lead. Um, it's, it's just been kind of interesting. So, Wow. Um, I like how you led with, that's a great question, as if we didn't ask it at the end of every episode. But um, because it was very stoic. It like, I was like, huh, what's he thinking? Um, I'm grateful uh, really for, I, I think most specifically, I was giving her a hard time earlier, but my wife, so she's, uh, she, she challenges me to be better on a consistent basis. Um, I'm constantly having to pivot and try to improve uh, how, uh, my, how I communicate and how I grow uh, because of her and so I'm thankful for that opportunity to get to be and do life with her I am also thankful for my spouse Robert um, he's a very supportive partner and I don't mean supportive like like my cheerleader like go babe yeah he's supportive in when when I'm at work all day and then at city council all night he's the one at home cooking for the kids doing the laundry um, helping them with their homework feeding the dogs and he knows that his role at home is just as important as being an equal partner as his role at work. And I could not do the things I want to do if he wasn't a supportive equal partner. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. What a great testament to the importance and the supporting role of marriage and what it means. So, um, so what a great episode. So thankful to have you out today. Um, folks, just continue to tune in. As always, if you want to get connected to Heather, uh, you can reach out to her via LinkedIn. Um, and the city, the city of Baytown. Um, you can always contact us if you want to get some questions out to her uh, through the Economic Alliance, their marketing team. You're also welcome to reach out to Clinton and myself directly. We would encourage you to do that. So if you have guests, thoughts, ideas, feedback for the show, 
please reach out to us and make sure you uh, subscribe to the channel. Stay tuned in, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.